Why? Who would not like to get a perfect result after a repair of the flexor tendon on the finger? To get such a result, it is not enough just to do a perfect repair. It is important to understand the basics of the tendon, the biology and the healing process of the tendon. We will be discussing the tendon biology under the subtopics of tendon development, structure of the tendon and the nutrition of the tendon. And as far as tendon healing is concerned, we will discuss it under the headings of types of healing, the stages of healing, the strength and quality of healing and the factors affecting the tendon healing, the factors modifying the healing and the future of tendon healing. And after every topic, we will discuss the surgical significance and how it will be useful in our day-to-day -day practice of tendon repair. This will be the general flow of this video. The development process of the tendon is very unique. First, the paraaxial mesoderm on either side of the neural tube will give rise to the paraxial somite. This somite will give rise to the sclerotome, the dermatome and the myotome and between the sclerotome which gives rise to the bone and the myotome which gives rise to the muscle, the syndetome arises. The sclerotome will form the vertebra and the ribs. The myotome will form the skeletal muscles. The dermatome will form the dermis of the skin and the syndetome will form the tendons. One more structure that forms from the somites are the endothelial cells which form part of the vasculature. So the muscle develops independently with the tendon precursors developing on both sides and these tendon precursors attach to the muscle both proximally where they attach the muscle to the bone that is the origin of the muscle and they attach the muscle to the bone again which forms the insertion of the muscle. Considering the chronology of the development between six and a half and eight weeks into the development of the embryo, the tendons are first detected at the ends of the fetal muscle bellies. It is interesting to note that the upper extremity tendons develop more rapidly than the lower extremity tendons and the flexor tendons develop more rapidly than the extensor tendons. So the flexor tendons of the upper limb are some of the earliest tendons to develop in the fetus. This fetal tendon consists of type 1 and type 3 collagen fibrils, proteoglycans and tenocytes. The fetal collagen fibrils are very small in diameter only about 10 to 30 nanometers and the fetal tendon is very cellular more than 200,000 cells per cubic millimeter. In the postnatal growth, Changes occur both in the cellularity and the matrix. The cellularity drops rapidly and during the first five years of life, it reaches about 100,000 cells per cubic millimeter and by the age of 15 to 20 years, the tendon contains only about 50,000 cells per cubic millimeter. The tenoblasts become tenocytes which are longer, more slender and have cytoplasmic processes that are elongated. In the postnatal growth, changes are seen even in the matrix. There is a relative increase in the amount of matrix and the collagen fibril diameters increase. They reach up to 500 or even 600 nanometers with no increase in the number of elastic fibers. The water content also drops from 75% of the newborn. When surgical attachment of the flexors is being done, at the myotendinous junction or the osseotendinous junction, we need to remember the importance of these areas and the role they play in transmitting forces. The structure of the tendon plays a pivotal role in the subsequent healing after repair. The basic structure is as follows. The muscle attached to the tendon at the myotendinous junction and then the tendon proper which is attached to the bone through a region called the enthesis. The myotendinous junction is very important because it is this place where the tension generated by the muscle fibers is transmitted from intracellular contractile proteins that is the actin and myosin to extracellular connective tissue proteins which are the collagen fibrils of the tendon. This is possible through the attachment of the terminal myofibrils to the muscle cell membrane proteins 
and the attachments of the muscle cell membrane proteins to the collagen fibers of the tendons. So, the actin filaments of the muscle are now connected to the collagen fibers of the tendon. Similarly, the osteotendinous junction otherwise known as the enthesis is also unique. It has four zones starting from the tendon. The first zone is the tendon, the second zone is the fibrocartilage, the third zone is mineralized fibrocartilage and the last zone is the bone. It also contains specialized fibers called the Sharpies fibers which are nothing but collagen bundles that extend from the tendon to the periosteum in the bone. Thus, the viscoelastic tendon transmits force to a rigid bone. The coverings of the tendon are the paratenon which is the loose areolar tissue encasing the tendon, the epitenon which covers the surface of the tendon and the endotenon which are the layers around the fibrils of the tendon. Of the tendon, 55 to 70 percent is water and 30 to 45 percent dry mass. This dry mass consists of cellular components and the extracellular matrix. Analyzing the cellular components, we find that the main cell type is the tenocyte or the fibroblast. It is responsible for the production and regulation of the extracellular matrix and the collagen. It is present in the epitenon and in the endotenon. Other cells like the tendon, stem, progenitor cells, the chondrocyte, synovial cells and the vascular cells have also been noted in the tendon. In the extracellular matrix are the fibroproteins of which 60 to 85 percent is collagen and collagen 1 forms the main component. Collagen 3 is found in lesser quantities as are collagen 4, 5, 11 and others. The ground substance consists of non-collagenous substances like the oligometric matrix protein, elastin, proteoglycans and inorganic components like copper, manganese and calcium. This diagram shows the cells present in the interfascicular zones. The functions of the extracellular membrane include the mechanical function of force transfer and the biological function of maintaining the microenvironment to ensure cell and matrix health. In this context, we need to remember that tendons are predominantly loaded along their long axis in tension, enabling muscles to move the skeleton to position the body and these are known as positional tendons. All the tendons in the body are positional tendons but some tendons have an additional function. When loaded, some tendons tend to store energy which they can later return to the system to improve the efficiency of locomotion. These are known as energy storing tendons. To understand better, the tibialis anterior is a positional tendon. These tendons are usually subjected to smaller strains and do not risk tendinitis or rupture. But the tendo Achilles is an example of an energy storing tendon which experienced strains in the excess of 10% or more and they are more prone for inflammation and injury. The extracellular matrix also has biological functions which pertain to the cell matrix interactions which are dynamic. There is also evidence that these processes can be adaptive and whilst the speed of adaptation is slow, tendon can thicken and strengthen in response to use. So, the structure of the tendon can be modified by aging, by injury, by exercise training and even inactivity. So, while doing the repair, we must understand understand that the force generated in the muscle must be transmitted without loss to the joint through the tendon. Hence, the repair must be done in such a way so as to ensure this. Understanding the nutrition of the tendon is very important. Though it has been dealt with in the video on flexor tendon anatomy, we shall deal with the salient points here again. There are three sources of nutrition, the osteotendinous junction, the musculotendinous junction and the mesenteric system. The mesenteric system consists of the proximal synovial sheath vessels and the vincular system. The synovial fluid provides nutrition by imbibation where fluid is pumped into the small conduits during digital flexion and extension. The vincular system is a very important source of nutrition to the tendons. It consists of two vinculae for the flexor digitorum superficialis, one longus and one brevis and two vinculae for the flexor digitorum profundus, again one longus and one brevis. This shows the vinculum longus of the FDS, the vinculum brevis of the FDS, the vinculum longus of the FDP and the vinculum brevis of the FDP. However, the distribution of blood supply to all areas of the tendon is not uniform. There are some low compression areas 
like over the shaft of the bone where there is no compression of the tendon and only gliding is present. Here the synovial system and the paratenone vessels are the only source of blood supply. In these areas the blood flow may be less than 10 ml per 100 gram per minute. On the other hand we have high compression areas that is over the joints where the compression forces are high on the tendon. There is more blood supply through the vincular system and this supply is mostly through the dorsal surface of the tendon where the vincular system enters. So the low compression areas or avascular segments of the FDS are the segment of the FDS beneath the A2 pulley at the level of the proximal phalanx, the segment of FDP beneath the A2 pulley and the segment of FDP beneath the A4 pulley. The vascular supply to the dorsal aspect of the tendon must be borne in mind while planning the suture. Repair of the flexor sheath will ensure continuity of the synovium which should also be considered. The avascular areas of the tendons must be dealt with very carefully. Before going into the details of tendon healing, we need to know the types of tendon healing that can occur. There are actually two theories of tendon healing. The extrinsic theory put forward by Potenza and Peacock where the synovium is most important and the intrinsic theory proposed by Lundberg which says that cell migration and tenocyte proliferation are the most important. When we compare intrinsic and extrinsic healing of the tendon, we find that usually all healing starts off with extrinsic healing. That is, fibroblasts from the paratenon start the process. Then, depending on the blood supply to the tendon, the fibroblasts from within the endotenon take over to start intrinsic healing. Extrinsic healing is more if poor quality of repair and prolonged immobilization are present. On further comparison, fibroblasts from the endotenon are responsible for intrinsic healing while the proliferation of fibroblasts from the paratenon, synovium and the sheath are responsible for the extrinsic process. Intrinsic healing has synthesis of mature collagen and extracellular matrix whereas the extrinsic healing has highly cellular matrix with immature collagen type 3. There is less water content in the intrinsic healing, hence a smaller volume of tendon and hence improved biomechanics like better gliding of the tendon after intrinsic healing while additions from the surrounding tissues limit gliding after extrinsic healing. You will note that the strength of the healing is almost the same both in intrinsic and extrinsic healing but the cross-sectional area is much higher in extrinsic healing and the elastic modulus after extrinsic healing is much lower. The surgical significance of all this is that we need to aim for more of intrinsic healing. This can be achieved by good technique of repair with respect to the vascularity of the tendon, gentle tissue handling to prevent adhesions, minimizing the repair site gapping and to ensure that sheath repair is done. We shall now see the different stages of tendon healing. The most important thing we need to understand is that natural healing process of tendons is still slow due to their hypocellular and hypovascular nature. There are three classically described phases or stages of healing which are usually overlapping. The first stage of inflammation can last up to one week and it starts immediately on occurrence of the injury. It consists of migration of peripheral cells and formation of external capillaries. The second stage of proliferation which can start as early as three days and extends for up to four weeks helps the tendon edges to unite with the help of these surrounding tissues. The third stage called the remodeling stage starts from four weeks can extend up to 12 months or even more. Here remodeling occurs within the tendon along with motion of the tendon. We shall see these stages in detail. The first stage consists of the inflammatory cells that is the neutrophils along with the erythrocytes, monocytes and macrophages which are recruited within the first 24 hours to cause phagocytosis of the necrotic materials. These cells release vasoactive factors to initiate angiogenesis, chemotactic factors to stimulate the proliferation of tenocytes and along with these the tenocytes from the synovium and the epitenon move into the injury site and start to synthesize immature collagen that is collagen type 3. In the second stage that is the stage of proliferation the tenocytes are involved in the synthesis of large amounts of collagen and proteoglycans at the site of injury and the levels of glucosaminoglycans and water are very high. After about 6 weeks from the time of injury, the remodeling stage begins. 
It consists of two parts, the stage of consolidation and the stage of maturation. The stage of consolidation lasts up to 10 weeks after the injury. The repair tissue changes from cellular to fibrous. The synthesis of collagen and gly glycosaminoglycans is decreased. The cellularity is also decreased as the tissue becomes more and more fibrous. There is an increased production of type 1 collagen. The fibrils become aligned in the direction of mechanical stress. The stage of maturation typically occurs after 10 weeks. Here, there is an increase in cross-linking of collagen fibrils. That is, the tissue becomes stiffer and the tenocyte metabolism and tendon vascularity decline. The repair tissue never completely regains the biomechanical properties it had prior to injury and the biochemical and ultrastructural characteristics remain abnormal even at 12 months following injury. So we need to understand that two processes are going on. One is cell proliferation which reaches a maximum at 3 weeks and starts reducing by 4 weeks and a cell apoptosis which is programmed cell death that starts after 2 months mainly on the surface of the tendon and this leads to remodeling of the tendon. Such an elaborate process of healing must be controlled. We have got many chemical modulators of this healing. The most important of these are the growth factors. The first is the insulin-like growth factor 1, which is IGF-1, which increases the collagen production in stage 1. The second is the transforming growth factor beta or TGF-beta, which helps in the wound healing and scar formation. The third is the basic fibroblast growth factor, otherwise known as the BFGF, which promotes fibrogenesis. The platelet-derived growth factor or the PDGF is important for the synthesis of other growth factors and the DNA and proliferation of the tenocytes. The vascular endothelial growth factor VEGF is important for angiogenesis. The other modulators of healing are enzymes like the metalloproteinases and their inhibitors which are known as the TIMPS. There are many other substances, for instance, the nitric oxide synthase, which is responsible for synthesizing nitric oxide, which is a free radical which helps in the apoptosis, or the substance P and calcitonin gene-related peptide, the CGRP, which enhance the cellular release of prostaglandins, histamines and cytokines during the proliferative phase. To ensure that all the phases of healing are conducted in the right manner, we need to ensure the blood supply is maintained while doing the repair of the injured tendon. The possibilities of using these factors to modify the healing process also can be thought of in the future. The understanding of tendon healing cannot be complete without making an attempt to understand how the strength and quality of the healing are achieved. Strength of tendon healing refers to the ability to withstand the forces of muscle contraction and the resistance. The quality refers to the tendon ability to glide smoothly in response to the force of contraction. When talking about the strength of the repair, it is of two kinds. The initial strength depends on the strength of the repair technique as such. Later, the strength of the repair depends on the strength of the healing tendon. This is because you can note in the graph, there is a decrease in the strength from the point of repair. It comes down and then picks up again. For instance, the tensile strength to permit active motion of the tendons is 75 newtons. The modified Kessler Mason repair gives us a strength of only 30 newtons. But when we start mobilizing this tendon or the finger after 3 weeks, the rupture rate is only 3% to 9% and not 100%. So, some amount of strength has been added to the original strength of the repair. That is the intrinsic strength of the healing tendon. So we have seen about the strength of the repair and we have seen about the intrinsic strength of the healing tendon. How can we increase these two entities? How can we increase the initial strength of the repair? Immediately after the repair, the strength depends totally on the suture material, the caliber used, the number of strands, the type of suturing and the technique used. This strength of repair will come down progressively. The force of the repair reaches its lowest level 
on around post operative day 5 it returns to its immediate post operative level by post operative day 19 somewhere between 3 and 6 weeks post tendon repair the tendon healing becomes the primary provider of the tensile strength. We have seen how to increase the strength of the initial repair. How can we increase the strength of the healing tendon? Controlled movement of the tendons after about one week following repair will help. How will this movement help? If there are movements, it promotes the synthesis of collagen by the tenocyte and increased tensile strength and fewer adhesions result. If there are no movements, the collagen fascicles show decreased tensile strength, lower amounts of water, proteoglycans and collagen cross-linking. These effects are possible because of the process of mechanotransduction. The tenocytes respond to mechanical force to alter their gene expression, their protein synthesis and cell phenotype and they cause changes in the tendon structure. There is also a change in the extracellular matrix where this movement affects the actin cytoskeleton of the cells. It affects the cell shape, motility and the function and the ion channels are activated by stretching to allow ions such as calcium, sodium or potassium to enter the cell. A strong repair initially is ideal so that some form of mobilization can be started depending on the type of repair. However, it must be remembered that even now protocols of immobilization for three weeks can be done but the strength of this repair and the results may not be as predictable as for mobilization protocols. We must also remember that a stronger repair initially does not translate to a better healing and function and stronger repair and mobilization are also fraught with complications like rupture. Tendon gliding also must be possible after a good repair. The future of tendon healing consists of use of growth factors, hormones, chemotactic factors like fibronectin or direct current electrical stimulation or pulsed electromagnetic fields or ultrasound to limit additions or the use of low energy laser therapy to provide pain relief, shockwave therapy, steroid injections, gene therapy, stem cell therapy or natural biomaterials like collagen based scaffolds to modify the tendon healing process to achieve better results. But we need to remember till we have further procedures and technology to improve the results of tendon repair and till we have further measures to speed up the process of tendon healing understanding the biology of the tendon and understanding the process of healing to better our technique is the key to good results after tendon repair. I hope you liked the video. Please click on the shown links to see more about flexa tendon repair, the biomechanics and the anatomy. And do not forget to subscribe to stay connected with the latest in learning hand surgery.